So Jesus, thank you so much for your word. We love your word, Lord. We thank you for the power every time we come before your word, that it is alive, that it is active, that it transforms us, that it conforms us into your image, God. We pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would cause the eyes of our heart to be opened, to be enlightened, to be receptive, to receive the revelation, Lord. That's the only way that we come into transformation. That's the only way that we come into repentance is through revelation from you. So Holy Spirit, we say yes. Just tell them yes. Have your way in me. Change me, Lord. Make me more like you. Amen. All right. So, uh, Easter's coming up, and uh, I know last week I talked about our purpose, right? What is our main purpose? Who remembers kind of a quick summary of what that was? What's our main purpose for living Mary, I think I heard you say it. <laughs> the teacher, come on. <laughs> to love God with all our hearts and for his love to flow through us to others. Yes, to let his love so flow into us that we are transformed by his love into his image. And what is his image? God is love, right? Jesus is the perfect image of God, the express image, it said. That word was character, remember? In the Greek, it's spelled with a K instead of our normal spelling. So uh, C-H with a K in the middle. So it was kind of fun. I'm like, wow, that's like almost the exact same word. <laughs> Just in Greek. Okay, cool. So he's busy working his character, his nature of love into us, transforming us into that image of love. So as we approach Easter, obviously the culmination of his love is that full pouring out of his life, right? He, he suffered for us. He died for us. Uh, he, is, he descended into hell for us, and then he rose again, and he ascended into heaven so, all for us, right? That's all to take away our physical sickness, our physical suffering. He suffered so that we would be healed, right? Pastor Justin mentioned that. So even his descending into hell and his ascension into heaven, all of that was working things on our behalf, paving the way for us as sons and daughters of living God to follow him and to be now even seated with him at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. Amen? So, Easter's coming, and I, I really encouraged you guys. Lent, you know, is kind of a, uh, I grew up Catholic, and uh, Lent was a thing, you know. We, we, I don't know if any of you saw this, I, I have to admit, I was kind of judgy and appalled. <laughs> but they had like, ashes to go. You could do like, drive through ashes. Who saw that? I was like, what? What is happening? <laughs> like, we can't even go to church for like 10 minutes to get the ash thing on your head? <laughs> We're going to go through the drive through window. <laughs> Father, ash me. <laughs> so, so um, but Lent was a thing, right? It was like a big deal in the Catholic Church. You had like Pancake Tuesday. You could like engorge yourself on pancakes before you started something of a fast, which really meant, I love Jim Gaffigan. He's like, means you eat fish on Friday or not, <laughs> I guess. Because there's just a the little bit of a, a funny way there with the Catholics. But uh, so... You, you are supposed to take that season to prepare your heart for what would be really the, the highest time of the year, right? Of our Christian faith, the greatest 
time of the year to enter into the fullness of what God has released to us, what he desires for us, um, all that Christ did for us. It's supposed to be a really powerful time. And uh, to their credit, I will say, um, the traditions, the, the seasonal traditions, year after year after year, are something that God did with the people of Israel, right? He had the Passover, literally, for thousands of years. And it was prophetically prophesying of Christ's coming. And so these type of things, when God institutes uh, celebrations and t holy times, that's what holidays actually means holy days. They were people actually stopped work and they went to Jerusalem to focus on the Lord for sometimes a weekend or a week or more to camp out in the presence of the Lord. And there was quite a lot of holy days, holidays in the Jewish culture. And so our big ones as Christians are what? Christmas and Easter right? So we're coming up to Easter, which is the biggest one, obviously. Christ's birth is significant and powerful, and there's so much in that. But without his death, without his resurrection, you know, his, his birth doesn't have the same value as what it is. So I want you guys to really take notice and to take that extra time with the Lord during this season to prepare your heart because we've been reading Ephesians, right? And um, in Ephesians 2, or 1, actually, sorry, I looked at the number 2 at the top, but it's 1. Ephesians 1, verse 17, Paul's praying, and I've said this before, but I want to say it again. He said, I pray that the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him through your deepening intimacy with him. Okay, so that's a progressive revelation. It's not a one-time deal. And that word revelation, spirit of revelation, actually also can be synonymous with the word discovery spirit of discovery. And so I want to challenge us because a lot of times uh, we approach it as information. How many times have you ever said or heard someone say, um, oh yeah, we learned that whatever, 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, right? And there's this kind of like flippant attitude of like, yeah, I already know that. I knew that a long time ago. And we want to be careful not to let that creep into us. I, that's something I love about Dick and Marion as elders here. How many of you guys love them? They're away on vacation right now. But they are awesome. They're, they're, even though they're advanced in age, their spirits are so youthful. And every time that we preach, they don't say, oh yeah, we learned that 40 years ago. They say, wow, that was amazing. That was so powerful. That hit me so profoundly. They, it's fresh. It's new. Every time to them, it's an it's a awakening, a fresh awakening. And the way that we have that is through transferring and, and posturing ourselves out of this attitude of like, I'm collecting information, right? Facts. We all learned the facts of Jesus' death. Whatever. Depends how old we are. <laughs> Maybe it was a long, long, long time ago, right? But the facts are not what transform us. The facts are just facts. How many people know other people who've heard the message of Jesus and nothing happened, right? What transforms us is when we engage with the Spirit of God and he gives us revelation, fresh revelation by his spirit of what he is saying right now, today, to his church, to his people. Amen? And there's, like this verse says, there's a deepening intimacy that comes through that. It's not just, oh, you know, when you met your spouse, you didn't just get to know them 
20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, and then never talk to them again, right? You continue to, to know them in new ways as they continue to walk with you and through different seasons of life and circumstances and all of that, you had new revelations of their heart and their love for you. And that's what God wants to do. So he wants to deepen our intimacy through revelation and a spirit of discovery. So that's why I'm on this uh, exploration of communion this year. The Lord put that on my heart to take communion every day and see what happens. Who ever approaches their faith like an experiment, right? I, I'm going to try this and see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to see what happens. And God wants us to do that. He wants us to take risks and to expand and step out. So for me, as I've been meditating on Easter and what that means— I've been praying for a fresh revelation of my salvation and, and a fresh purification and cleansing. And um, last week I talked about love being formed in us. I want to jump into a little bit of what that looks like, what that means. So if you turn really quickly with me to Galatians 5, verse 13, we're going to read... If you're like me, and you're like, where is it again? Go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. <laughs> like, oh yeah, gee. <laughs> so Galatians 5, 13. Um, you probably all have it on your phone, so you're not even turning pages. <laughs> Just tap the icon. It says this, and I'm going to read from the Passion Translation, because that's the... Uh, translation I've been exploring. The Lord had me switch translations. Makes me terrible at quoting scripture, but it really gives the full meaning of it into my spirit and my mind. So verse 13, beloved ones, God has called us to live a life of freedom in the Holy Spirit. Say freedom. freedom. Who wants more freedom? freedom. All right. But don't view this wonderful freedom as an opportunity to set up a base of operations in the natural realm. Hmm. Freedom means that we become so completely free of self-indulgence that we become servants of one another expressing love in all we do. Right? So freedom actually leads us deeper into love. We're free from sin, which prevents us from loving, and we're freed up into the love of God that enables us to love others. So sin's effect on us is to block the expression of the love of God to us and through us. Okay? So keep that in your mind. Verse 14, for love completes the laws of God. All of the law can be summarized in one grand statement. Every law, the whole Old Testament. Who's ever tried to memorize scripture? Probably in Sunday school, most people. <laughs> they make you do it in Bible college too. Big chunks of it. I did not do very good at that part. But um, all of it. You, don't, you can just not even have to remember all that if you can remember this one thing. Demonstrate love to your neighbor even as you care for and love yourself. Or love your neighbor as you... Say it again. Okay, the golden rule. <laughs> but if you continue to criticize and come against each other over minor issues. You're acting like wild beasts trying to destroy one another. Yikes. Who's ever criticized someone over a minor issue? I know I have for sure. <laughs> Stupid stuff, right? We get caught up in it. Verse 16, as you yield freely and fully to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, how do you get this freedom? Through who? Holy Spirit, yielding yourself to Holy Spirit. 
you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. For your self-life craves the things that offend the Holy Spirit and hinder him from living free within you. That's not good. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit's intense cravings hinder your old self-life from dominating you. Isn't that good? So the Holy Spirit in you is yearning and longing for godly things. So there's this dual thing going on here, right? So then the two incompatible and conflicting forces within you are, number one, your self-life of the f flesh, right? There's still that. Who knows? Sometimes your flesh is alive and kicking. Number two, the other one is, and the new creation life of the Spirit in us. We are a new creation in Christ, right? Verse 18, but when you are brought into the full freedom of the Spirit of grace, you will no longer be living under the domination of the law, but soaring above it. The cravings of the self-life are obvious, and I'm going to read this because sometimes it's good as we approach Easter, right, that there is a purification, a repentance, a cleansing. So I'm going to read this list and let the Holy Spirit speak to you if there's something in your life that he wants to, to bring freedom to you from. So the cravings of the self-life are obvious, and you can close your eyes if the people walking around distract you. <laughs> Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, Resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, <laughs> being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behavior. So that's stuff that God wants to free us from. And how many of you, just so there's uh, freedom in the room, how many of you would say one of those things somewhere in that list, you could say, yeah, that was speaking to me. It should be probably every hand in this room, right? There's something in there that you're like, oh, yeah, I've been thinking of myself or I've been loving my own opinion. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, okay, haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom realm of God? And I want to bring that up because I know there's teachings about hyper grace and things like that, where people use grace as an excuse for sin, and that's not the purpose of grace. The grace of God that we see through Jesus Christ, through his life, is meant to empower us to become like Christ. Amen? And so that includes freedom from all of these things. Um, so, uh, verse 22. But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all of its varied expressions. And actually, I was uh, meeting with Ted this week, and he pointed this out, that in this translation, they make it really clear. We talk about the fruits of the Spirit, and we say, oh, there's nine fruits, or there's this many fruits, or whatever. But here, the author is saying there's only one fruit. The fruit is love. And love expresses itself in many forms, right? Right? So the Spirit in us produces love, and love leads us to this. Joy that overflows when his love is filling us. Peace that subdues. Patience that endures. Kindness in action. A life full of virtue. Faith that prevails gentleness of heart, 
and strength of spirit. Isn't that a beautiful list of what love produces in us? How many of you would say, yes, I want more of that in me, right? Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Say limitless. Limitless. Keep in mind that we who belong to Jesus, the anointed one, have already experienced crucifixion, for everything connected with our self-life was put to death on the cross and crucified with the Messiah. We must live in the Holy Spirit and follow after him. So may we never be arrogant or look down on another, for each of us is an original. We must forsake all jealousy that diminishes the value of others. My beloved friends, if you see a believer who is overtaken with a fault, may the one who overflows with the Spirit seek to restore him. Win him over with gentle words, which will open his heart to you and will keep you from exalting yourself over him. Love empowers us to fulfill the law of the anointed one as we carry each other's troubles. I'm going to close at that spot, but I want you to think about that definition of love, what it produces in us, what it looks like. And if there are, I brought it up in communion, you know, because sometimes we get too uh, comfortable in being justified in holding something against someone, right? Yeah, they may have sinned. They may have totally messed up and they were wrong and they hurt us. But that's still no reason for us to hold anger or offense or unforgiveness towards them, right? The scripture is clear that having quarrels, having temper tantrums, having disagreements, all that kind of stuff is a part of the flesh, the old self-life that we are no longer supposed to live out of. But the one who overflows with the Spirit, who wants to be the one who overflows with the Spirit, right? You can look at yourself as you come to the communion table, as you come before the Lord, and, and recognize, am I overflowing with the Spirit by the way that you love, by the way that you forgive, by the way that you release things that people have done or said or how you've been treated? Because love forgives, love covers, love seeks restoration, and not in a haughty way, right? Said in a gentle way, remembering that hey, maybe tomorrow you're going to be the one who messed up and you're going to be the one who needs forgiveness. So we don't have arrogance and we don't treat someone in a belittling way when they've wronged us, right? Pointing out. It's amazing to me. I was going to get into, but I don't have time. I was going to get into 1 Corinthians 13 where the gifts of the Spirit, it's amazing the list of what it says in the beginning about speaking in all the tongues of men and angels, right? But your words aren't produced out of love. What is it? It's like a clanging gong, a noisy cymbal, right? You're like, Ugh. and it goes on about prophecy and about charity, right? You could give all of your possessions and even give your body to be burned. But if you've done all of that without love, it says you have gained nothing. That word gained means we're supposed to be getting something. What are we supposed to be getting? Love worked into us, produced into us, even when it's painful, right? Christ, as we approach Easter, we see the extent where his love led him. How many of you, if your child was sick, or in a, in a dangerous situation, would trade your life for their life in a minute, right? Like, yes, let me be the one who suffers for them. Well, that's the attitude that Christ had for us, and that's the attitude we're supposed to have with our parents, with our spouse, 
with our neighbor, with our coworker, where we literally lay down our lives, right? How do we know what love is? Because we see it in Christ. He laid down our lives, his life for us. And so I want us to consider and let that be reproduced in us in a fresh way, to have a fresh revelation. We knew before that Jesus forgave us, that Jesus died for us. We knew that, that his forgiveness empowered us to forgive others, but maybe it's gotten old, right? Maybe it's a little stale. There's some stuff we've accumulated throughout the year, but this is a time for us to come again into that place of the cascading riches of grace. That was in Ephesians, and I saw this picture one night in open heavens of Jesus on the cross, and it literally said those words, the cascading riches of grace. And so I saw the cross and Jesus on the cross, and coming over the top of the cross, the arms of the cross, it was like this waterfall of grace. And when we spend that time reflecting on Christ's love for us, his forgiveness to us, it's like coming and standing under the waterfall and letting that grace wash us, cleanse us, just saturate us, penetrate us with his grace so that we too become the image bearer of God and we walk in love. Amen? So I'm going to lead us in a little prayer. And then we're going to hear from Sarah. Is Sarah in here? Or is she in the other room? If Sarah's not here, can one of the ushers run and go get her? All right. <laughs> Norm, are you going to get Sarah for me? Could you do that? She's here. Perfect. All right. So we're going to pray. So everyone stand up. And I want you to put your hand on your heart. And I want you to picture yourself under that waterfall of grace. And if there's any of that stuff, that list that I read out of the self-life, right? There was anger, there was selfishness, there was uh, pornography, there were addictions, there were all kinds of things in that list that we read. So as you just picture yourself standing under the waterfall of grace at the foot of the cross, I want you to recognize and believe that right now the Holy Spirit is washing those things off of you and freeing you through grace to live a life of love. So repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for how extravagantly you loved me. that you gave yourself for me. You gave everything for me and held nothing back. Right now, I just receive that. I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your cleansing. I receive new life and grace, yeah. And I choose to let go of whatever you've shown me that is of my old self-life. I lay it at your cross and I ask you for grace to live a different way today. Holy Spirit, do I need to go to someone and make amends? Do I need to get rid of something out of my life? Show me now how to live more freely and walk in your love. And I want you to just listen. So the Bible says it's the Holy Spirit who convicts us 
and also who gives us the revelation and the empowering to become a new person, a new creation. right now he might be telling you to take time with him later today or to take communion like I'm doing or to go call your mom or somebody that you've been disconnected from whatever he tells you take note of it if you have someone with you that you love that loves you be accountable. Tell them what the Holy Spirit said to you. Say, this is what I want to do. I feel like the Lord's telling me to do this. So Holy Spirit, I ask that the work that you are doing in us, the deepening intimacy that you're leading us into, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and God our Father, in the love of God, that you would seal that work upon our hearts. That God, what we have received today, what you've deposited into us today, we would grab a hold of it and we would act upon it and we would live it out. That from this moment forward, we would never be the same because of a fresh revelation of your cross and of your love. And everyone said, amen. All right, give somebody a hug, and then I'm going to transfer over to Sarah.